The Two Daisies Lambert and Landry resolved to start out into the world to seek their fortunes. They were, in fact, obliged to, their parents being very poor people, and quite unable to offer them any promise of better days. So, early one spring morning, the two youths set out on their way. Landry was but fifteen years old, while Lambert had just turned sixteen. They were, therefore, very young to thus throw themselves on fate's unsteady care, and while they had much hope, they also felt some little anxiety as to the future. But, as it happened, they were strangely comforted by an adventure which came about almost at the beginning of their journey. It was in this wise. As they passed by the edge of a little wood, who should come out to meet them but a lady, a lady decked with flowers from top to toe. Golden cups and pimpernels were in her hair. Her gown was trimmed with convolvulus blossoms, and fell down to two tiny slippers of moss, which looked like green velvet, while her eyes were like two blue cornflowers. It was the fairy springtime, whom you may sometimes see and hear about April, tripping and singing across the flowering meadows and through the budding woods. Stopping the youths, she said, I have been watching you. And, as you are about to start out on a long journey, I'm going to make each of you a present. Here, Landry, take this daisy. And to you, Lambert, I give a daisy also. All you will need at any time is to pluck one of the petals of these flowers, and throw the leaf from you, in order to secure that which you most ardently wish for. Now go, and try to make good use of springtime's presents. The youths thanked the fairy with all the politeness at their command, and then, with light hearts, set out on their way once more. But scarcely had they arrived at the crossroads than a disagreement sprang up between them. Lambert wished to turn to the right, Landry to the left, when, to settle the dispute, they decided that each should go as he pleased, and so separated with an affectionate shake of the hands. Perhaps, after all, each brother was not particularly disappointed at being alone, in order that he might the more freely dispose of the present made him by the flower-clad fairy. On entering the first village he came to, Landry saw a young girl leaning from a window, at sight of whom he started with pleasure. Never had he seen so lovely a creature. Never, in fact, had he dreamed that any such existed. Still little more than a child, with hair so fine and so blonde that one could scarce distinguish it from the sunny air about her, her face was delicately pink and white, a lily as to the forehead, and a rose to the cheeks. Her eyes were like a bed of violets in which a few raindrops lingered, and you had only to look at her mouth to wish that you were a bee. Landry did not hesitate long. He tore off and threw away the first of the daisy's petals and the wind had scarcely taken up the frail leaf before the girl had smiled at him from the window, and the next instant had run down and placed her hand in his. Landry soon grew tired of his pretty playmate, but each leaf brought him another. Indeed, his only aim in life was to find a way of tasting all of its pleasures. Whatever he saw, he longed for, and whatever he longed for, he had. Each day, each hour, in fact, the daisy lost one of its petals, and the breeze could scarcely find time to stir the branches of the rose trees, so much was it occupied in wafting about the leaves of the fairy's gift. Brother Lambert adopted an entirely different plan. He was a saving young man, one for whom it would be impossible to waste a treasure. As soon as he found himself alone on the road, he decided to carefully treasure the fairy's gift. For, so he reasoned with himself, no matter how numerous the daisy's leaves there might be, if he were to tear one off for every whim and wish, the day would soon come in which there would be no more leaves to pluck. He decided, therefore, to prudently reserve the wonderful flower until some future time. So, when he reached the next town, he bought a little box, very solid and fastening with a well-made lock. In this box he placed the daisy, resolving never to look at it, so that it might be out of temptation's way. Sensible, methodical, and troubling himself only about serious matters, 
Lambert became a merchant, and soon amassed large sums of money. He had nothing but contempt for those neglectful people who passed their time in feastings and frolics, caring nothing for the morrow, nor did he ever fail to preach good round sermons to such triflers, whenever the opportunity offered. So it came about that he was looked up to by all honest folk, and that his life was spoken of as an example for all to follow. He continued to grow respected and rich, working from early morn till late at night, and each day rolling up his wealth. But, truth to tell, he was not so happy as he had hoped to be. He could not help thinking of those pleasures which he so persistently denied himself. Yet he had but to open the little box and throw a petal to the wind to have as many pleasures as his brother had enjoyed. But he steadfastly turned away from such dangerous thoughts, and decided to wait. There was plenty of time, he said. He would enjoy himself when he was older and more settled. The breeze, while whisking by him, whispered, Come, throw me a leaf. Throw me just one, so that I may bring you at least one pleasureful day, and that I may see you smile for once. But he turned a deaf ear to the entreaty, and the breeze went off to stir the branches of the rose trees. Now, after many years had passed, it happened one day that Lambert, while visiting one of his country properties, chanced to meet a ragged man, making his way across the clover field. "'Well, well!' exclaimed he, throwing up his hands. "'Are you not my brother Landry?' "'I am certainly he,' replied the other. "'Why, what a wretched state you are in,' said Lambert. "'I am sadly afraid that you have made but poor use of the fairy springtime's gift.' Well, said Landry, I did, perhaps, throw away the petals too quickly. Still, though I am now but badly off, I do not repent of my youthful thoughtlessness. Ah, Brother Lambert, I may have been wasteful, but I was very happy as long as the flower lasted. Pooh, pooh, said Lambert, there is little comfort in that fact for your present condition. Now just look at me. Here I am, rich and prosperous yet I have but to make a single move to enjoy all the pleasures which you have wasted. Is that possible? said Landry. It is, replied his rich brother, because I have kept the fairy's present intact. Aha! He went on. I can still have all the good times that I wish, when I wish. So much for being economical. Come, he added, and I will show you my untouched flower. They soon reached the place where Lambert kept his treasure, and, selecting a small key from a big bunch, he opened the tiny box. There, he exclaimed with an air of triumph, see how I have kept my flower. But he suddenly turned pale and staggered back, for instead of the fresh-blooming daisy, which he had locked away so many years ago, there was now nothing before his eyes but the little heap of grey dust like a pinch of ashes. Ah, cursed fairy, he cried, you have played me a wretched trick indeed. As he said this, the fairy springtime herself stood before them. I have played you no trick, she said, neither you nor your brother. Those two daisies were not real flowers. They were your youth, your youth, Landry, which you passed in the pursuit of caprice and pleasure. Your youth, Lambert, which you have allowed to wither and fade without ever having enjoyed or valued it at all. Landry, it is true, wasted his youth by recklessly plucking off and throwing away its many chances. But you, Lambert, have not even the remembrance of having had any youth at all. 